A couple of days ago, a white paper was released, co-authored by Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum. It laid out details of soulbound tokens, or SBTs. The main difference between these tokens and like ERC20 tokens or NFTs is that they're non-transferable, whereas with an ERC20 token you can buy it and sell it on Uniswap, you can transfer it from one user to another, and the same with NFTs. These are pieces of data which are directly linked to a user account or a user's wallet address. So a soulbound token might store an account balance or a digital certificate or a link to an IPFS address and a hash similar to NFTs, but that would be directly related to a user's account. So this is the white paper. It's authored by E. Glenn Weil, Pooja Olhaeva, and Vitalik Buterin. I'm sorry for butchering most of those names. And if we scroll down, there's a section here about the souls, and it says that our key primitive is accounts or wallets that hold publicly visible, non-transferable, but possibly revocable by the issuer tokens. So if we think of all the tokens that we currently use, like the ERC20 governance tokens, for example, and non-fungible tokens or NFTs, they're all essentially smart contracts. They're contracts written in Solidity that are deployed to the Ethereum or for other L1 or L2 networks, and they hold data. So with an ERC20 contract, for example, it holds an account balance. So it, it takes a, a ledger, basically, of everyone's Ethereum address and how many of the tokens they own. And then it puts functions in there to kind of transfer and approve spend of them tokens by that user. An NFT contract is very similar in that it stores data of maybe an IPFS address and a hash. And then it will have a mint function which kind of allocates that data to a particular user or a particular Ethereum address that owns that specific image which is stored on IPFS. With soulbound tokens, we're doing essentially the same thing, but I think it's got a broader applications because it can be used almost like a user database. If we scroll down a little bit further, the white paper goes on to describe some of the different use cases such as R, lending, and this is under collateralized lending, so basically building up a reputation score within a smart contract referring to a particular user. There are obviously a lot of um, privacy concerns here. Do you want your kind of credit rating to be on a public ledger or a, a transparent open blockchain? It talks a little bit about airdrops and civil attacks and the idea that we're kind of trying to get to this stage where there's one account per person and this doesn't necessarily solve that problem but it could go some way to kind of creating a situation where it's more effective or it, there's less fraud and civil attacks. A civil attack is basically where one user has thousands of accounts um, and these people will go on when they know there's gonna be an airdrop for something and they'll use these thousands of different accounts to kind of do different things to try and get a larger allocation for the airdrop, an airdrop of new tokens such as a governance token, for example. With SBTs, maybe there could be a situation where there's years of data built up over time from various different maybe social networks or lending platforms, and that could give an idea of who's real and who isn't and which addresses have this history and deserve the airdrop. It's not a perfect solution, but it could potentially improve the efficiency of how we're doing it currently. And it goes on to talk about a decentralized society. Web3 aspires to transform societies broadly rather than merely financial systems. And I think this is where they're going with that. I, whereas kind of the, the tokenization we've seen so far has been very focused on financial technologies, the idea of soulbound tokens or non-transferable tokens could be used almost like a user database. And everything we use a user database for today, that, that could potentially be decentralized in the future. And that might seem ridiculous now because the gas fees make it impossible to do this on Ethereum mainnet. But over the next year, we're going to see Ethereum migrate to Ethereum 2.0. And this won't happen, this increasing capacity won't happen during the merge. It will actually come during the second part of that migration, the surge, where we'll see data sharding put into place and an expansion of the capacity of the Ethereum network. That combined with layer two technologies is going to make transactions faster and cheaper. One of the downsides of having user data stored on chain is that it's public accessible by everyone. There's an infographic here about the, whether the on-chain data should be fully public or whether it should be stored offline and then just a hash of it stored within the smart contract itself. The white paper goes on to talk about zero knowledge proofs and how these could be potentially be used to obfuscate some of that data when privacy is a concern. 
At the end of the document, the conclusions are drawn that the importance of civil protection and decentralization are essential to an effective decentralized society. One thing to note is that soulbound tokens are still in the early stages of development. There isn't an ERC-20 standard as such. I've put together my own interpretation of what a smart contract could look like. And this is kind of, I'm setting out a data structure known as a soul. And this is kind of fully customizable, so you can store whatever you want here. Bear in mind that blockchains aren't really des designed to store large amounts of data. If you want to store large data like images or videos, then it's much better to store it offline and link to it with a URL and a hash. I have a URL, a score, and a timestamp as part of this data structure. And then we go on to have functions for the operator, which is the contract owner by default but to be able to mint this and associate that data structure with a user. So you can give each Ethereum address that interacts with its contract, an identity, a URL, a score, and a timestamp for as to when that was minted. The end user themselves has the right to burn the data, so the end user has control over their own data, and I think that's quite important. And then the update function is also done by the operator, so they can update their sole data as and when they need to. If they want to change something, such as the user's score changes, then they could update that. We have public view functions to check if a user has a soul and to return the soul for that user. So it's, this is obviously public information. So anyone can call these functions for a set address and it will return the data. And then finally, we have a similar thing, but for third parties. So a profiles are basically the same data structure, but rather than the operator or the contract owner being able to set it, either the end user themselves can or any third party contract can interact with this contract and set its own data profile. The end user, again, has complete rights over that data profile to remove it. I think it's important to note that there's nothing really revolutionary happening here. It's always been possible to associate account data with an Ethereum address on using Solidity. Having said that, I think that the idea of tokenizing this and creating a standard for it it's gonna make it more compelling and easier for developers to use, and it could become a really useful tool, especially once we see Ethereum 2.0 roll out the sharding updates to increase the capacity, and layer two is also being more widely used by end users. If you're a blockchain developer, and it's well worth having a read for that document and seeing some of the details about the potential use cases for this in the future. I hope you've enjoyed this short introduction to Soulbound Tokens. If you're interested in learning more about blockchain development and decentralized finance, then consider subscribing, and please hit the like button for YouTube algorithm. Thank you for watching.